morning. I'm sorry I couldn't be here this morning uh, to visit with you. I'm uh, traveling today to a meeting in uh, Kansas City to talk about beef cattle genetics and evaluation. And uh, But I'm glad to see that, uh, that it, it is raining in our part of the country. I started talking about uh, drought management uh, in uh, April of 2011 in Brazoria County, and I think that uh, over the over the next uh, eight months, I gave uh, almost uh, 45 presentations to different counties and county groups. But one of the things I always wanted to talk about was, as part of those talks, in terms of drought management, what to do, uh, how to make it as relatively painless as possible, was to design, get folks to think about designing some sort of a drought early warning system. This isn't a new idea, and it's not even my idea. I actually stole it from a good friend and mentor of mine, uh, Mr. Leroy Forrester of Orange Grove, Texas, a former beef master breeder and a good commercial cattleman and a good, and a good grass person. Uh, Leroy spends a lot more time uh, looking at his grass than he does his cattle because he knows uh, that's the source of his income. And uh, so uh, this drought early warning system that we're going to talk about, uh, uh, my knowledge of weather patterns, uh, all come from him. And I just wanted to give him a, a little attaboy for that. I'd also like to thank uh, Pete and Megan for their work and, of course, the county extension agents for helping set this up. As we look at this drought monitor, you'll probably see a lot. I see uh, 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 John Metz is going to be talking a little bit later on this afternoon. Uh, these drought monitors have been useful in terms of educating folks that uh, uh, as drought evolves, as dry periods evolve. This is the most recent one. I think that there'll be one released uh, next Thursday. Uh, but uh, back in uh, the summertime and the late fall, Texas was as solid red, dark as you see the wing, the West Texas wing, the Trans-Pecos area. Some 95% of Texas looked like that. Uh, now you can see there are still pockets uh, uh, up towards uh, Del Rio or Eagle Pass. Perhaps you still see, uh, uh, excuse me, still learning how to operate this system. Uh, you, you still see the uh, a, a dark area, but most of the rest of the state uh, is starting to come out of the drought, and uh, as a result, uh, looks pretty good. Uh, well, let's hit. There we go. Looks pretty good, especially up around Dallas and Fort Worth. Uh, down in the coastal bend, the brush country, we still have some pockets of uh, some severe drought, uh, and, and hopefully those will go away. But nonetheless, the effects of the drought are still here with us. Now, if we look at the this, this is just a little bit closer closer up uh, view of the state and individual counties. You can see your individual county and how it's affected. Coastal bend, the lower coastal bend, is still in very tough shape. Uh, and uh, northwestern uh, Webb County uh, and up through that part of the country. But uh, it, it's not so much what the drought monitor is showing us today. It's the fact that we have, we remember what the effects are still with us. This country has fed a lot of rice hay, a lot of sugar cane strippings, a lot of corn stover, a lot of, sure, uh, a lot of stalk. I even had a phone call from somebody uh, wanting to bring uh, grasses from from the Middle East and Africa over here in huge bales and of course that wouldn't be allowed. Just one more graphic. Uh, we're, I've been uh, pretty much all over the district now. Districts, uh, region, uh, Houston, College Station, not quite to Laredo, George, but uh, down in the valley and, and a lot of us, a lot of it looks green. We've been blessed with having some rain. I had uh, over four inches in February at my place, uh, and that's almost as much as I had during the entire uh, 2011 season. Uh, but that helps us now, but what do we expect to see in the future? So you can see that typically in our part of the world, uh, 
and and those of y'all that uh, have been out to the Trans-Pecos region, you know it never looks blue like that. It's mostly brown, but that just kind of gives you an indication. That green band to the middle of the state, to the middle of our region, 15 to 20 inches of rain. Uh, if I were to have shown the bottom right-hand chart uh, uh, during the summertime, the uh, uh, it would be it would have been uh, uh, red and yellow. It would have been totally devoid of rain, and you can see now that we see very little yellow, uh, lots of gray. In, in fact, up around San Antonio and Houston, it's blue. Uh, tr a tremendous amount of rainfall in some of those areas, but uh, instead of missing 15 to 20 inches of rain in our part of the world, uh, we've cut that down considerably. We're still missing, you know, six to 12 inches of rain. So it's important to pay attention to rainfall. This is just a typical location. It's not uh, Jim Hogg County. Uh, it's probably closer to the coast. Uh, and I've done this in each one of the counties that we've done a program at. I've picked a town and, and looked at the average rainfall by month, typically long term, 20, 30, 40 years, getting a rainfall average. And so you can see that for this particular location, uh, rainfall average is 40.7 inches and you can see how the rainfall occurs uh, and you know that in the last 10 years or so we haven't had any significant hurricanes to speak of we've had some tropical storms in the valley but you can uh, you can kinda get an indication of the rainfall pattern of course forage pattern is going to follow that I know that uh, Macon and uh, it will be talking a little bit later about uh, about forage growth so you know keep in mind this rainfall pattern so what Leroy had talked to me about and had been trying to get through my thick skull over the last uh, uh, 25 years or so that I've known him in particular the last seven or eight is this drought early warning system uh, and what it requires is some indication some knowledge of past rainfall records everybody that's in agriculture ought to be collecting rainfall records. They ought to know what their average rainfall is almost by month so that you know whether or not you are de this month is better or worse than average. Too many times we rely on our own memory uh, to bring that forward and we need to write these records down and we need to keep some sort of a tabulation of them. Yes it's good to have an idea of how much rainfall by looking at the local town for example here at the at the research station we could look at the airport rainfall records but the airport may catch a thunderstorm uh, that uh, that maybe an, maybe another location five or ten miles away may not so you need to have good rainfall records for your location and not rely on uh, a, a nearby city or town you need to know knowledge of past rainfall records then you need to think about looking into and understanding what the ENSO or El Nino Southern Oscillation is the El Nino, El Nino, La Nina uh, that, that um, uh, John Metz will talk to you more about this afternoon is not the only major weather maker uh, for our part of the world but it is it is one of the major weather makers and it certainly has a tremendous impact on our weather so you need to know where we're at in terms of the El Nino, La Nino, La Nina uh, cycle and then it, to pay attention to the current market and and what your stocking rates are uh, I'll go back to, 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 to Leroy and Leroy actually has a stocking rate based on whether or not he's dry or wet or normal and what the what the what the uh, forecast will be from that from that point on so currently uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation the, we're, we're kind of in the La Nina pattern it looks like we're moving out of the La Nina pattern based on reports from the folks that measure sea surface temperatures looks like we're going to go probably into a neutral period perhaps or maybe we're going to go into a uh, to an El Nino uh, but the La Nina pattern has not been good for winter and spring rains uh, yes I have gotten and we have all gotten some good rains 
uh, in, in, in perhaps in late January and certainly throughout February, at least more rain than we would have expected. But it's not not how much it it rains, but when does it rain? Uh, right now, having moisture in the ground uh, probably will help our our friends that are growing uh, cotton and grain sorghum and corn, and certainly will help those folks that uh, were astute enough or, or or big enough gamblers to put in some sort of a winter pasture. Uh, but for those of us that are relying on 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 warm season annuals, uh, or or native plants, or improved grasses, uh, those are probably still about a month off. Yes, it's going to give us some soil moisture, uh, but it's more important, to, and so it's more important to pay attention to when it rains, that is during the growing season, as opposed to uh, the, the the cooler months when, when plants aren't growing. So this is just a, a brief review of what you see in terms of El Nino Southern Oscillation effects on, on the southern U.S. Uh, there's a number of good websites that you can go to, but it's important, I think, that everybody understand that when the weatherman or the meteorologist says we are expecting an El Nino, we're expecting a La Nino, or we're currently in a neutral pattern, what this means for us, so that you don't necessarily have to go to the website and track this information, but that you understand what's happening. So essentially we have a you know, warm eastern Pacific uh, over towards Australia, and Australians do a really good job of tracking this pattern. They actually me measure uh, temperatures all the way across to the coast of to the east coast of Africa. The trade winds are from the west and so during the summertime when we have an El Nino in effect, lots of times we don't get our tropical storms. That's exactly what happened in 2011 during our hurricane season. We had an El Nino in effect and these trade winds uh, blew the tops off these hurricanes and these tropical storms. Uh, the jet stream moves uh, south across the southern U.S., so it brings us rainfall uh, across the southern U.S., particularly during the winter time. So we have wet springs and falls and winters in the south, but typically dry summers because we have no tropical storms. Uh, La Nina, which is currently, well, it's prob we're probably moving into a neutral period, but it what has been in effect during the winter time. Uh, the eastern Pacific is cool. Uh, so those, uh, 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 excuse me, that should be Western Pacific, I apologize. Uh, trade winds are from the east. Uh, jet streams uh, uh, move north across the United States, so instead of coming across uh, South Texas or Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, they move up into the northwest uh, into uh, Washington, Oregon, Northern California. Uh, they get uh, terrific uh, monsoonal rains up in that part of the country. Uh, we have a dry spring, fall, and winter in the south. And then, of course, uh, we have uh, wet summers and tropical storms. So, you know, we really prefer a uh, La Nina summer, uh, but would rather have an El Nino in effect the rest of the year. But you don't always get what you want. Uh, this is actually taken from the El Nino website, and, uh, and, and blue is cool and yellow is warm. And if we had done this uh, six months ago, uh, the area that you see uh, in uh, uh, just, off the co just off the western coast of South America, that red line represents the equator, would have been mostly blue. And you can see now it, that it is mostly yellow almost some red in some areas and so we're seeing a a, 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 a temperature shift uh, more towards an El Nino pattern but in the meantime it goes through what we call what is called a, a neutral pattern but at least we start to see that 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 part of the ocean is starting uh, to warm up now now this is some data that uh, that uh, Leroy Forrester's collected for about the last uh, 35 years uh, and at his ranch uh, just uh, southwest of uh, Orange Grove uh, and and what he did is he has his average rainfall up there which is that first column and so that you can see across the top there average rainfall for January is 1.55 uh, average rainfall for March is 1.70 and so on 
And then what uh, he did is he said, all right, based on whether or not uh, the rainfall for that month was in an El Nino, a La Nina, or a neutral period, what percentage of that monthly rainfall could he expect? And so, for example, if we go back to January and we see that the average was 1.55 inches, in an El Nino year, he would expect 123% of that. In a La Nina year, he would only expect 90% of that. Or a neutral period, he would only expect 84% of that. And so then if we go into February, you can see that uh, uh, El Nino, he would expect 228% of that, more than double that rainfall. A La Nina, about 27%, just a little bit more than a quarter. But if we had a neutral period, he would expect about 99%, almost normal. And so you can go across to the average and then look at each period. And, and then you can kind of look and say, okay, today is uh, March the 1st. Uh, we're in a La Nina moving towards a neutral period. How does it look for the next three months or so? Well, if we're moving into a neutral period, for March, we're expecting about 107% of normal, so about 7% more rainfall. And then for the next three months, April, May, and June, we're expecting about 91, 92, and 92% rainfall. So not terribly bad, almost average. Uh, not as good as if it were perhaps an, a La Nina in April at 133% or an El Nino in May and June at 185 or 135 percent, but not terrible. And so, but it does give, give you an indication of how this El Nino Southern Oscillation Pattern, the El Nino La Nina periods affect rainfall patterns. Now I want you to go back and look uh, in, uh, in, in July and August and September and pretend that we're last year, okay? Uh, pretend, pretend that we're uh, last year, and you can kind of look and see, you know, wh what the rainfall patterns look like in terms of of uh, of going into the winter. And if we looked at uh, La Nina, by the time we got to December, we were at 52 percent and then about 90% in January and then down to 27% in February. So we can kind of use this chart. It's not 100% accurate, but it gives us an indication based on long-term averages. Now, what actually happens in your operation at your place may be slightly different, and so it's important to go back and think about, if nothing else, what are the monthly rainfall patterns and what do they mean for me when we move into an El Nino, La Nina period? The other thing that I can I would like to encourage you, and perhaps Megan is going to use this or one of the other spe speakers, is the USDA Natural, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service Web Soil Survey. It's on the web, uh, and, and I'm not going to take a bunch of time to explain how to use it here, but you can go to that website. You can work with your county agent. You can work with your NRCS specialist, and the, you'll create an area of interest, and it will give you soil types, and that's exactly what you see is I uh, created an area of interest for uh, my place. It gave me the soil types. It'll tell me what the vegetative productivity is, and from that point, I can actually determine range production for favorable year, for a normal year, for an unfavorable year, which is where the red arrow is pointing. Uh, and that kind of gives me an indication of stocking rate. Uh, but my place is roughly one-third improved pasture, and that would be uh, coastal Bermuda and buffalo grass and some climb, uh, rapidly being taken over by, uh, by KR Blue Stem. And believe me, uh, you have a you can you have a great much greater appreciation for KR Blue Stem after this drought uh, uh, than perhaps you had before. But about two thirds of my country is brush, and so you need to actually 
adjust your stocking rate uh, for that brush because it doesn't grow much grass, uh, particularly if it's very heavy brush. And so what you do is you look at that, you click on where it says unfavorable year, and it gives you an indication of for each different types of soil types that you have on your on your place, on your ranch, on your pasture, it tells you how many pounds uh, per acre could could be produced. Now remember this is could be, not necessarily is produced. If your country has been through a tr tremendous drought, if it's been uh, terribly overgrazed, uh, if it has a lot of brush on it, uh, you may not have this productivity level. Uh, and so then you can kind of give you an idea that down there at the bottom, if you look uh, for my place, areas uh, uh, normal versus dry, in a normal year, if this were none of this were brush, it was all in, in, in rangeland, it would produce 956,140 pounds of forage. In a dry year, it would only produce about 748,085 pounds. That's about 85% less. And so instead of running 22 head in a normal year on this place, of 300 acres, I could only run 17. So instead of 1 to 14, one animal unit to 14 acres, I could only run 1 to 18 and not expect to feed anything except perhaps a little protein supplementation. So if we look at this, this is the steps to avoid a drought management plan. Three months in a row with below average rainfall, and you can see at this map, if we looked at this map and we said, okay, average rainfall, that 40.7 inches we talked about earlier is in blue, when did I have three months of below average rainfall? Well, by March, I was in trouble, and yet I still had to go through the rest of the year. Start thinking about implementing your drought management program. Now, don't do that on the third month don't start thinking about what your drought management program is. Think about it now. All right, but think about implementing it on the third month. And, and it is some, something very simple as this. Early wean and sell your calves. Okay, and yes, you're not going to have a bunch of big calves to sell. Fortunately, this past drought, we've had tremendous cold cow prices and, 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 and hugely fantastic uh, calf prices. But if you'll early wean and sell calves, that'll help reduce nutritional needs of the cow herd by about 35%. That'll help those cows get back into shape and get rebred. Uh, you can market bigger, older, and younger cows because we want kind of those middle-aged cows to remain in the herd. The bigger cows are going to have a higher nutrient requirement. Those that give more milk will have a higher nutrient requirement. Older cows that may not make it through the drought nearly as well really young cows that have higher nutrient requirements. No, they don't eat as much as those big cows, but they have higher nutrient requirements in terms of protein and energy. And then you can purchase feed and hay in advance of your neighbors. Uh, and as we said, we look at this particular uh, chart. This is this this person probably should have begun their 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 plan in April. Now what happens in April if rainfall returned to normal? Well, you're just ahead of the game. Yes, you've sold your calves, uh, you've marketed some cows perhaps that you didn't need to, and you bought some feed and hay, but at that point, you're ahead of the game. Maybe you transition into using some some stocker cows or, some, or go buy some calves uh, to use some of that extra forage or stockpile that forage. But the main point is, is to have a plan. Now, I want you to think about something else, and that is kind of adjusting to reality. Uh, in this particular scenario, this particular location, uh, in five of the last ten years, 50% of the rainfall was below the average of 40.7 inches. So you can count those blue bars, and you can see that there's a one that the 2003, 2005, 2006, uh, 2008, uh, 2009 was almost there. 2010 was close, and then of course 2011 would have been the sixth year. But essentially, every other year was dry and required us to think about feeding cattle, uh, selling some cows, selling some calves, worrying about uh, pastures, maybe overgrazing pastures, uh, worrying about all different kinds of, of issues. Well, if you thought about considering stocking rates to, to adjust 
what I consider reality, and it doesn't have to be 75%. I called it 75%. It could be some number. You pick it. But if we re adjusted the stocking rate to, to reflect the 75% rainfall, 25% reduction in rainfall, 75% of normal, okay, we're only in a drought two out of ten years, one out of every other, okay, essentially. And if you look at that particular chart again, the, the bottom red line, you can see that we go a number of years, okay, before we get into a drought. So it looks like we can go three or four years before we get dry and then we have a dry year. Then we go three or four years and then we get dry. Then of course in 2011 we really got dry. Hopefully 2012 we're going to get back up close to normal. It doesn't have to be that draconian but it is something to think about stocking at a lower rate than you currently are. You have less calling, uh, early weaning, less early weaning, less feeding, and you have better pastures. Uh, then Mac Young's going to talk about this a little bit later on, and I just want to call this to your attention. You know, will it pay to reduce stocking rate? Uh, uh, Mac and Megan, Mac and Megan, and and myself and and Steve Closey looked at uh, different scenarios, and Mac will talk more about this. But the important thing is, over 10 years of using real life ranch practices. If we reduce stocking rate during a drought, by any means, we reduce cost by almost $16,000. And then, if we kept the stocking rate at 75%, this is what people don't understand, is if we kept the stocking rate at 75% after the drought, we made money. We made more money because we had less feeding, less culling. And so, don't be afraid of implementing a drought plan. Uh, of of trying to develop one and then implement one and put one together, because we all know what these drought effects are: a body can, reducing body condition, reducing cold cow value because they lose weight and they lose muscle and fatness, reduce fertility, and so on. All costs increased, and particularly in this particular drought, when folks were paying ninety to a hundred dollars a bale for hay, and four hundred dollars for range cubes and other products. Even if you could find hay, it was priced at, at, at levels that were ne had never been heard of before. And now, of course, cattle will be ex extremely high in the coming years because this drought coincided with the greatest reduction in the national cow herd that we've ever seen. So just in some closing thoughts, here's a reason why you want to think about creating your own drought early warning system because you're going to have to reduce the stocking rate. Let's do it ahead of the game before everybody else does. You might consider, as part of that drought plan, selecting a sacrifice pasture to feed in troughs because we know you can save money uh, in feeding in troughs as opposed to feeding on the ground. Less feed is lost. Uh, slow your pasture rotation down. One of them might catch a shower. Test your hay. If you buy hay, if you raise hay, test it for for protein and energy, it costs you about 10 bucks. You may not have to supplement as much. If you buy grain crop residues or haze that you're not familiar with, get those tested. And particularly if they're sorghum type products uh, or products that you're not familiar with, get them tested for nitrates and prussic acid. Uh, keep a good mineral out. Now, lots of times we think about uh, not worrying about mineral because it's a drought and it costs money. If you are using unique or innovative feeds or feeds that you're not familiar with, remember that you've got a factor in the cost of fuel and labor. Uh, at some times, uh, some, in some locations, molasses tubs, even though they are hugely expensive, um, may be more economical if you're feeding at several locations or, or infrequently. You just have to put the pencil to it. They're great products, uh, but the initial cost is high. Uh, salt intake, if you use range mills that have some salt in it as a limiter, they're going to increase water needs and in a drought most of the time we run out of water before we ran out of grass. Now check water sources regularly for quantity and quality and remember that during a drought we'll have cattle that get sick from things like eating toxic plants, uh, respiratory diseases, perhaps black leg or anthrax that are in the soil. Uh, cattle eat or lick things that they're just not supposed to and so we'll have some sickness, some animal loss will have uh, reduced immune response, uh, compromised immune system. So we need to watch uh, for those kinds of problems in our cattle. And just remember, 
that 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 we are we're I don't know whether we're out of this drought or not. Perhaps not. Perhaps we are. But there's another one just around the corner and so it makes sense at this time as we think about oh I might want to restock or I might want to rebuild or I might want to put some cows back on that pasture it looks green to me even though it's full of weeds maybe now's the time to think about creating that drought early warning system before we're fully restocked again thank you very much Sorry, I guess I guess uh, I, this is this is Tiger's Vicky round. Thank you.